And that's why I'm not allowed in Pizza Express anymore. And we're live. You are now listening to Radio Rufus. This is episode four of Radio Rufus, where we bring you the most awe-inspiring, mind-bending, eye-opening, horizon-broadening content from around the world. The best news, sports, games, songs, every single week. Although some of the scoops might not be quite as fresh as you'd imagined, because we are, of course, still set in the radiant glory of our vintage radio station. Coming up on this week's episode, a turkey that terrorised a town in Quebec has been taken down by a slingshot-wielding resident. Punjab United ends their run in the Kent Senior Cup. And bad news for all my Icelanders out there, as we might have a repeat of 2010. All that to come on Radio Rufus. Let's start with our first segment then, not news. These are the headlines this week. A turkey that terrorised a town in Quebec has been taken down by a slingshot-wielding resident. The granddaughter of El Chapo has joined the hunt for the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland. A Singaporean influencer who staged a fake public egg attack on herself in Taiwan has started selling bottled farts for $300. And a hospital in York has apologised after a sign it displayed branded Indian food as smelly. Let's get into our main story then about the Quebecois turkey. So a turkey, uh, a berserk wild turkey, has gone rogue in the streets of Louisville, Quebec, and it has finally been slain. Several residents had filmed the turkey in question, terrorising people in the town of 5,000. The mayor issued a call to arms and spoke to a local man who was known as a, quote, good shot, getting him to agree to taking down the turkey. He finally killed it with a slingshot. Here's what the mayor had to say. When it's attacking citizens or children, a person in a wheelchair, it doesn't matter. That's not normal. I'm here to defend my citizens. Wow. <laughs> it's not every day that you have a berserk turkey terrorizing the town. It's not. It's also not every day that you've got a vigilante whose main sidearm is a fucking slingshot. I was going to say, um, surely there's something better than a slingshot in yeah. the village. <laughs> it's some, this is the most Looney Tune shit I've ever seen. Yeah. The only thing that could have made this look like it was from a cartoon anymore was if his melee weapon was a frying pan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't think there's been any slingshot kills since David and Goliath, honestly. <laughs> This is it's David and Goliath, and then this is round two. He must be an absolute sharpshooter with it, though, to be able to actually take out a fucking turkey. Yeah, with... I don't. Maybe I just don't know anything about slingshots, but I just feel like they're just a bit shit. Yeah, do you know what I mean? It's like it's like going to war with Russia, and then they turn up with a trebuchet, <laughs> and you've got like ground to air missiles. And you're like, what is what is that? Sure, yeah. that doesn't work. Just a complete mismatch. Just flinging rocks. Yeah, yeah. And I feel I feel like a turkey can get out of the way of a stone from a slingshot. Turkeys seem... Also, imagine if you're trying to hit it for a fatal shot. You're going for the face, the neck. Getting a fucking rock into those areas, you need to be precise with it. So the fact yeah. that he managed to pick it off, I'm assuming at a distance, is really <laughs> impressive. Do you think... Well, maybe it was just close quarters combat, like he just yeah. ambushed, ambushed the turkey <laughs> and got it from behind. He was just sitting in like a hedge. He was camping. Yeah. <laughs> camping. <laughs> Waiting for it to come past. It's so Canadian, I think. I think it'd be really difficult to find a local slingshot expert, like anywhere around near me, for example. The, the fastest hand in Quebec. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's not a load of slingshotters in Hove, let's just say that. <laughs> it's definitely a dying art. Whenever I was younger, yes. you would like find a certain stick that was just so happened just so happened to be like slingshot shaped, a bit of rubber band around it, you fling stuff at your brothers, your friends. Yeah. But to have one like a military grade one that can take out a fucking turkey. I didn't even know this still existed, but apparently yeah. so. And yeah, I just I just can't believe that this is the most effective method. Like they're in a small town in sort of ruralish Canada. I feel like somebody's got to have a crossbow or a rifle. There's a, there, there's a hunting season. Yeah. So that's absolutely ridiculous. I just feel like <laughs> doing this is like trying to open a safe with a pair of tweezers. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's just not. You need a sledgehammer at least. Yeah. Yeah. I saw also that it, the the main reason for this is that the turkeys get really aggressive during breeding season. Yeah. So I think it was Horny just... Turkey. Yeah, it's just horned out and it's taken all the aggression out in the citizens. Yeah. I also saw that 
they can get that agitated that they will attack their own reflection in a car. Like, Imagine seeing that. Do you remember that story? That story about um, Kanye beating off to himself in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that's exactly basically this. this in Turkey form, isn't it? The only thing more mental than seeing a turkey get slingshotted to death would be seeing one start a row with itself in a reflection. Kanye breast, turkey breast. That was good, right? <laughs> Top quality. Hey, it's it's pun city here on Radio Rufus. Bit more on this story then. So. It's illegal to hunt wild turkeys in Quebec before the hunting season begins at the end of April. So this, this has happened before then. So this is an illegal killing of a turkey. The Quebec Wildlife Ministry have opened an investigation into the turkey's killing, noting that even during the hunting seasons, provincial regulations don't allow for citizens to snipe aggressive turkeys with slingshots. Right? A spokesman from the ministry said, I think the way it should have been handled is through the proper channels. Whatever the fuck they are, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know who's who's like what sort of desk jockey is in charge of that. How often are turkeys terrorizing a town that yeah. they have like a backup plan? Plan they have a process in place. The turkey division. <laughs> He's, however, the mayor has remained steadfast, saying that if they bring me to jail, I'll go. <laughs> I think it'd be hilarious for him to get brought to jail for over this. What is the sentence for? Come on, they can't. Be, it can't be big. Surely he could just get off with some community service. I would have thought. Yeah, you, you would like to think so. It's not as if like a fucking turkey is the national animal of Canada or something. People can be no, pretty. No, they're actually they're actually regularly eaten on a yearly basis. So obviously, it's illegal to kill the turkeys, and it, it's a it's illegal to kill them all year round with a slingshot. And the reason they give for that is because with a slingshot, as you rightly said, it's not exactly a precision instrument, is it? Nah. Yeah, it's like um, trying to fix something with a hammer <laughs> right not the most subtle yeah exactly um and they say that there's a high likelihood of the turkey being injured that sort of thing but surely if you injured it right you could then you just have another shot and just put it straight out of his misery like i don't really get that point yeah i'm not just hitting it once i'm making sure it's gone for good it's not as if like fucking rocks are hard to come by you, no. you don't have to go and replenish your ammo you've got another rock handy you could just put it out of his misery in two shots exactly <laughs> i also I'm, I'm questioning the origin of this turkey where's this turkey coming from because it's like an aggressive wild turkey and i'm imagining now a sort of jurassic park kind of situation <laughs> Like something made up in a lab? Yeah, where an experiment's got out of hand. They've spiked a turkey and it's sort of escaped the facility. It's going to the wild. What I'm worried about is thousands of other unknown turkeys that we don't know potentially <laughs> following this one out, getting big ideas, escaping and terrorising the Canadian wilderness. I'd watch that film, in fairness. If yeah. that hit the cinemas, like a Jurassic Park turkey fucking version, I'd be the first in queue. Yeah. I was going to come up with another pun, but I couldn't. Jurassic Jurassic beak is the closest I've got so far. Jurassic cock? No, it doesn't work. It's not a fucking hen. Jurassic cock is funny, though, just yeah. as a phrase. <laughs> <laughs> just as a general idea. Uh, it says, the story ends with, The man who shot the turkey with a slingshot brought the claws back to the mayor and the birds will be cooked and eaten on Friday. Love that. that Absolutely is, love That's some small town banter right there. Yeah, that is a that is a par move though. Yeah. Just in case any other turkeys out there are getting ideas, we're going to fucking eat your friend in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> turkeys, are, turkeys are wham as well, and it's not a very big village. I reckon they could do a Jesus sort of five loaves and two fishes situation and have enough for everyone. <laughs> Feed the 5,000. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Our next story then. The granddaughter of famous Mexican drug lord El Chapo has joined the hunt for the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland. Frida Sofia Guzman Munoz, the granddaughter of Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, the notorious drug dealer who escaped from a prison uh, by tunnelling out with a spoon in 2015, in one of the all-time... Honestly, that puts the Great Escape to shame. <laughs> they need to make a Great Escape 2 for El Chapo. She's been spotted hunting for the mythical Loch Ness Monster this week. Um, I believe there is an image up on her Instagram of this. Where she has 112,000 followers. That's a proper, that is a proper, proper um, following there. That's not something you just come by. I, I suspect El Chapo might have something to do with that. And what I find interesting about this is she's basically going into railing. If you see, if you see, the, if you see the other pictures, she's gone everywhere. Hey, there's the Louvre, Disneyland Paris, 
She's been to London. She's got pictures with everything. She's just on like a tour. She's on a European tour. I'm. I'm. What I'm wondering is, who's paying for this? I wonder who. Yeah. You talk about being a fucking nepo baby, like the the no, best. Here's the thing, like, so I I had to I worked over over a winter in a cocktail bar whilst I was at uni, and I saved up enough money to do this sort of trip in the summer, and uh, basically going into railing. But I think she's probably done that as well. You know, she seems like a hardworking girl. Yeah. Uh, I can't imagine that this trip would have been financed through any uh, questionable means, personally. It is mental growing up in the world of social media where everyone uses it, even the children of, like, notorious bad guys. Even if they had nothing to do with the crimes, they're still going to be known as, for this example, El Chapo's granddaughter. It's actually kind of sad. You know when, like, an artist you like goes to jail? Yeah. Like, when R. Kelly came, it came out about all the, the piss and stuff yeah um i i feel a, sort of the same about this i'm having trouble separating the influencer from the cartel <laughs> like i see i see these images and all i see is going to disneyland on the back of blood money which is quite a funny concept in a, in and of itself yeah like this is such a unique page on the internet there's the f- not many of this about yeah, the fact that you can get 112k followers because your granddad deals drugs is absolutely mental to me. And I think that's something I love about the world we live in now is people like this are given a platform for absolutely no reason. <laughs> Who do you reckon if other like notorious villains, people like El Chapo, if their sort of daughters, children, granddaughters were to have social media, who would you like to see? Yeah, that's a great question. Oh, I'd love to see like, I guess it wouldn't really be possible, but I'd love to see like Jack the Ripper's kids like kind of about <laughs> kind of about London, like his ends and stuff. Uh, Can you imagine you're like Hitler's nephew, and all you wanted to do was start like a Minecraft Let's Play, but just all the comments was giving you shit because of who your uncle was. Yeah, like there's there's no escape in that. You can do very little. I think to it's shape an that easy connection. silver play button though. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> I think 100k is guaranteed with the Hitler connection. Yeah. Yeah. Mein Kampf to Minecraft. Yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mine, Minecraft. Yeah. yeah. We've got the title for his Let's Play sorted. So yes. if you're out there, you know, we can sell you the rights. I think I know what his Let's Build is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say you can get one way tickets for it. Um, oh, what I find interesting about this is the choice of locations he's been to. There's some, obviously, if you're. A South American, and you want to see the world. There's some obvious spots. Obviously, you would go and see the Eiffel Tower. You go to London, one of the cultural capitals of the world. Loch Ness monster. Okay, I'm not so sure. Of, I'm not. I I wouldn't even bother with that. No. I don't really know why she's gone there because it's obviously just a bit of driftwood. Yeah, <laughs> obviously, you've seen the pictures. Yeah, I don't, that is bark. I don't buy any of that shit, especially not these days. Whenever new photos come out, because. It always seems to be the case that whenever there's a sighting of aliens or Nessie or Bigfoot, it's taken with the shittest camera of all time. Everyone has fucking iPhones now. Yeah. Surely if the, these sightings were, as people say, you would get a clear photo. Yeah. But it's always this shit that looks like a poorly photoshopped GCSE media project. Project. Yeah, you know the, those things they, they print out on the exam and it's in black and white. It's, <laughs> it's so hard to see. Yeah, you, you can't afford the coloured printing. It's like captures on old websites and all the letters are overlapping. It's totally impossible to tell what it is. Yeah, I, I get exactly what you mean. Like, surely you think in this day and age, someone would just have a solid snap story of it or yeah. something. Alleged alien sightings that there be and that you see the conspiracy theories about. If it was really happening, as much people say, you would have a clear photo at this stage. Because it's always the same shit. And it looks like it was taken by Nokia 3310. But the- Also... Doesn't look like a monster. Yeah. It looks like a bit of wood. It looks like an alligator at best. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but mostly it looks like someone's boat hit the rocks. It's come apart. It's floating on the water. And someone from a bit of a distance um, has taken a grainy image of it, uploaded yeah. it to a like a subreddit full of neeks, <laughs> and they've all gone, yeah, this is definitive proof that this exists. Yeah, it's always the case. So, Frida Guzman, I hope you're having a lovely time in Europe. I'm I'm sure you hope you're enjoying the cultural delights of our continent. And uh, I hope you uh, manage to find Nessie, if she really does exist. Wishing you all the best. Have a great time. And I hope your grandpa is doing well in the US prison system. Bring us back some magnets as well. 
for your <laughs> travels. That'd be nice. Yeah. Send us a postcard. I'd absolutely love to hear from you. If you want to come on the show, we'd absolutely we'd absolutely love you. We're big fans of you, Grandpa. So um <laughs> big fans of his work. Big fans of his work. We even I've, got some implements that he might use on like a regular basis. Yeah. So if you want to come on, email Cal Freezy at the Fellas Studios <laughs> and we'll make it happen. <laughs> Our next story then. A Singaporean influencer who staged a fake public egg attack on herself in Taiwan has started selling bottled farts for three hundred dollars. <laughs> Starting to become a bit of a theme now. Um, bottled farts, unfortunately. Have we accidentally become the number one source for bottled fart content? <laughs> you know what we've done? We we've opened the jar and now we can't get it back in. That's exactly <laughs> what's happened. <laughs> we've opened it up. Smellers smellers escaped, and you can't ju- you can't just cram it back in yeah. the jar. It's now spreading around the studio. It's hanging on to the clothes, the material. Yeah. This is a mental story, though. So Singaporean Instagram star. Cheng Wing Yi hit the headlines this week when she was forced to issue a public apology for orchestrating a phony attack whilst in Taiwan. She got her male assistant to assume the identity of a middle-aged woman and pelt her with eggs in the city of Kuaxiong. It was live-streamed on whatever the Asian version of Twitch is. I couldn't be bothered to look it up, so that's what I wrote down. It was only after a police investigation that she admitted it was an act and apologised. Um, so... I feel like how how stuck have you got to be for ideas, right? To as, as soon as you start like pranking yourself, yeah. it's getting bad. Like you, you now we're edging towards of coming out as gay, even though you aren't. <laughs> if you know what I mean, sort of levels of desperate desperation for content. You used to think like React channels was the pinnacle of desperation whenever yeah. it comes to trying to get a video out, trying to make content for the sake of it, but she is literally egging herself in the off chance that it might go viral. What's the point of getting her male assistant to dress up as a middle aged woman? Surely he could just pelt her eggs without the stew, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think people are gonna be reading into it that much. They're like, Oh no, like if if it was just the assistant in her normal day to day clothes, no one would bat an eye. So I don't know what the thinking was. Well, I, honestly, I can't understand the thought process behind the whole thing, but there's just extra things that wouldn't occur to me to do. Like, well, the whole egg attack wouldn't occur to me. But why are you making him dress up? Why are you in Taiwan when you're not from there? Like, what's going on? And it's it's one of those live streams that I really dislike. So I, I'm not a huge fan of live streams in general. I think they're a bit creepy because it's so raw yeah. and un- un- unedited. I think they're a bit, it's a bit, um, what's the word? It's like voyeurism. It's like hiding in women's bath, winning, women's changing rooms at Debenhams. So you can like look over the, look over the top. Yeah. It's a bit sort of pervy, a live stream. Especially a lot of people keep their streams on overnight. Do you see the people on like TikTok sleeping people on stream? sleeping you know? on stream. What the That's fuck's that about? It's crazy. It gives me the creeps. I'm like, I don't need to, to... It feels so intimate. Yeah, you're sitting watching them snore and then people, you can like leave comments or whatever to like sound a blow horn or something to freak them out. People are depraved, man. Yeah, so this, so she live streamed this egg attack. Yeah. So I assume she had a cameraman as well. This is a full-on production. I don't know how you can make this look legitimate. <laughs> Getting egged in public. Yeah. On a live stream. You always see the pranks and people claiming they're real and stuff like that, but they've got a full on camera crew. Like surely people know. Like Also, how are the police getting involved in this? Like, this isn't really a police matter to me. No, it doesn't this seem is, like this is a huge waste of police time. It's an it seems like well, it seems like an orchestrated self attack. I don't know why the, who's filing charges here? Is she filing charges against herself? D- maybe that's what she did. She because she only admitted it was an act after the police investigation. So maybe she filed the charges to make it look lo- more legitimate. Yeah. And she's then trying she's to get been, like a few stars. Yeah, she's been absolutely exposed <laughs> here. Yeah. But now she's tired of the bad publicity, understandably. That can wear you down as a person. So she's pivoted into a new venture, selling jarred poots, sealed with love notes for $300. And... Um, <laughs> Showing that I really have significantly underestimated the size of the fart jar market. <laughs> They're sold out on her website. She reckons as well that the smell can be retained for up to a month. After, like, even after opening the jar. 
and I'm I may I am calling bullshit and that. Like I have smelled some hateful eye watering <laughs> ruin your day farts, especially yeah. with the lads I lived in uni. Yeah. Yeah. But even there had like they might have had a shelf life of 10 minutes max. <laughs> She's claiming that these are lasting a month. She is full of shit and farts. <laughs> you know, like a radioactive element yeah. will deteriorate over time and just turn into a rock. I reckon this this fart jar doesn't have the longevity of like uranium. Nah, not it's at all. Not, it's, not, it's not like Chernobyl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <sighs> fart jars, man. I'm worried that it's starting to catch on. Yeah, I saw like a tagline on her Instagram as well. Are you curious how your favorite streamer Kira Kitty smells? Don't just imagine it. Feed your curiosity. This is how she's selling them. This is her marketing campaign behind it to get people to hit by. Thing is, I'm a naturally in- inquisitive guy. I love to learn <laughs> new things. So that's sort of reeling me in, to be honest. I think that's quite good marketing. Do you reckon you have any crazed fans that are curious to smell how you- your farts? Yeah, as I stated on episode two. I think there are some freaks out there, but if they were to hit me up, I'd charge them an extortionate price for an empty jar. Yeah. Or I get someone else to rip arse in it and then just bottle that up and they're not going to be able to tell the difference. After that fucking tuna chocolate sandwich I had in episode two, I could have, or sorry, episode three, I could have sorted you out there. (laughs) You did disappear for a bit after that. I didn't realise you were getting the Stephanie Matto treatment and having (laughs) having all the gas removed from your stomach. I was a jar away from making 300 quid. I think we might be perpetuating this problem though because we keep publicising fart jars on on our show. I guarantee if you look at her sales, there was a spike every time this episode goes live. Yeah, that reminds me. So when I went to school, we had a sort of YouTuber girl at our school. She had sort of 200, 300K on YouTube. And one time she posted a vlog and she was eating a Nature Valley granola bar, not a sponsor. Uh, And we checked the stock price and it was up that day. So from then on, we had a long standing joke about her being able to wildly influence the stock market through vlog posts. (laughs) There has to be a correlation. I, there's got to be somebody from this show who has listened to it and thought, you know what, cool, that's actually up my street. Yeah, especially there's that's, what, like... That's starting to give me word, that is. There's probably a Bar few job. million views across all social media pages of the show. Yeah. At least one person listening, one person watching right now has paid for a jarred fart. Yeah, so if you are that person, send us a text. We'd love to talk to you. <laughs> We'd love to smell your jar. Right, our next story. A hospital in York has apologised after a sign it displayed branded Indian food as smelly. This one's got layers to it as well. Just like a uh, Indian flatbread. In the library at York Hospital, a sign was put up that read food and drink policy. Hot and cold drinks are allowed in the library. Please do not bring any food into the library space. Especially not samosas, pakoras or filled chapatis as they are very smelly. Don't laugh just at that. (laughs) Right. It was posted on Twitter where it swiftly garnered four and a half million views and provoked widespread backlash. The trust quickly took action, saying, we are truly sorry for any distress or upset that has been caused by the sign. As soon as we were made aware of it, it was removed. It was absolutely not in line with the values and behaviours of our organisation. It's just, so they've got a rogue individual in the company taking it down from the inside. It's like that guy who put Lehman Brothers out of business in the big short. Yeah, like, I I don't personally enjoy the taste or smell of Indian food, but specifically listing only Indian foods and deeming it smelly, it just feels very targeted. So, initially when I read this headline, I was like, that's funny. What they're going to have done there is it's going to be a sort of just the wrong word choice, you know, this is why education is really important that we do the right things. Because I think the word you're sort of looking for is, it, we, we, we can all just agree on the basic level that Indian food tends to be more heavily spiced and has more bold flavours than the food we have in England. And just on that reason, it's going to be more, and I'm going to pick this word carefully now, fragrant than... Um, Good choice. Than English food. I thought they were just going to have used the wrong word. Um, they don't mean that it's, that it's smelly. And um, that was going to be it. But no, because when you read the wording, it actually does feel like a hate crime. Yeah. Because they have singled out some 
which a pakora. I don't even know what the fuck that is. No. Nah, so, nah. <laughs> so they've they've really singled it. Out. They've really honed in yeah. on the subcontinent here, singling out samosas, pakoras, and filled chapatis, and calling them all very smelly. I mean, how many samosas are being brought into the average hospital? <laughs> I feel like. I haven't been stuck in A&E and I've had like a waft of samosa come past. I don't feel like that's ever happened to me. Yeah, you're getting like the shit sandwich bar food. You're not getting yeah. a fucking Indian. Nobody's ordering a curry whenever they're in a hospital waiting room. Yeah, the food they have in the hospital is not, you know, it is, <laughs> it's not like sundries, rice, naans, curries. They don't have that. It's like wartime sandwiches. Yeah. It's the only place in England you can still get corned beef at hospital. It's <laughs> so there's there is somebody with a proper racial vendetta here. There's nothing on it at all about like fish, smelly cheese, other yeah. things and foods that are particularly fragrant. It's just only targeting the Indian ones. It feels a bit it feels a bit racist. Yeah, it's <laughs> It's absolutely incredible. So when I real I read this, my perspective quick quickly shift from Oh, that's funny. To oh, there's a dreadful racist in this hospital somewhere. <laughs> you would, especially for a library, like you would never assume a librarian would be racist. Like you'd imagine they're well enough read to know better. Yeah. <laughs> Very smelly as well. <laughs> they really wanted to get the emphasis on just how smelly all this stuff is. <laughs> it's so it's so hateful. All you needed to do was say, please do not bring any food into the library space, which is the second sentence of this sign. That that last sentence was so unnecessary. Absolutely ridiculous. So shame on you, that one mole in the organisation at York Hospital. Um, you're going to get banged up. Right, on to Snatch of the Day then. This is our sports segment. And today we've got a football special. Two stories coming at you from... The lower levels of the English pyramid, I think it's fair to say. We're not exactly covering the Premier League here. Firstly, a grassroots football cup tie has been boycotted over the horrific name of one of the teams. So players at Camden and Islington United have boycotted their next match after they were paired up with North London-based Manta Hunters FC. <laughs> after finding out the name of their opposition, they contacted the FA. The fixture is being p- postponed while an investigation takes place so munta hunters fc this is the sort of, sort of thing that i i can't believe gets past the football association i just don't get how it at all applies to football you would understand if you wanted to like hunt munters on a saturday night or something <laughs> but what the fuck does this have to do and what association does it have with the game of football yeah i, I don't know this is like this it's like it reeks of sort of 40 40 or 50 50-year-old men who still watch the in-betweeners religiously, if you know what I mean. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I don't know how they squeeze this name past the FA because I'm assuming that all football clubs, this is like a semi-professional sort of lower league team, still have to be registered with the Football Association. They've still got to okay all the branding and stuff. Mm. And they can't have been the first team to play against Munta Hunters FC. This can't be their first fixture. So there's got to be a lot of clubs who have got... it was like a semi-final, wasn't it? Was it a semi-final? I think so. Yeah. Oh shit. Yeah. Um, so they've got through the they've got through the group stages. <laughs> yeah, nobody raised any alarm <laughs> through all of that. They played a round robin, <laughs> and nobody had any problem with it. It was only the players at Camden and Islington United. And they've come out and said, you know, because they have many women women's teams, they've got women on the board of their club, so they will refuse to play anyone with a misogyn- mis- misogynistic name like Munta Hunters FC. I'm I'm shocked that they managed to get away with that. And you know what's funny as well? Another bit of dodgy behaviour from the FA. So they were going to give Camden and Islington the loss on this one. Oh, yeah, because they were trying to forfeit it? Yeah, so they were going to boycott it because we were saying we refused to play it. And they said, well, in that case, you lose, you're out of the cup. <laughs> The the people at the FA definitely are like secret Munter Hunter fans. They're the ultras at the, the <laughs> Munter Hunter games. Got the chance. <laughs> yeah, their their chance would be like our girlfriends are clapped. Our girlfriends are clapped. Munter Hunters. Our girlfriends are clapped. Also bad form from there. You don't want to advertise that you're a Munter Hunter. Yeah, you don't want to admit to that. Yeah. That means you you're settling you're you're settling for uh, girls who you definitively describe as ugly. It's sort bad of, all round from every direction. It's sort of a self-burn. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> so um, we'll let you know when that fixture takes place after the investigation. I'll be very surprised if the FA doesn't ban Munter Hunters FC. At least, <laughs> relegation at least, I would have thought. A points, points loss. It's they're like when least, you get bankrupt. <laughs> they're, they're at least getting some form of suspension. Right. From Munter Hunters FC on to Punjab United, which uh, unbelievably is based in Kent. So Punjab United is a genuine genuine English English football system team and they lost to Maidstone United 4-3 on penalties in the quarterfinal Kent Senior Cup which is one of the premier competitions in this country. If you're an American and you don't know anything about football that's like the Super Bowl of of football basically. It's a really really big deal. Everyone gets up and watches it. Uh it's talked about for weeks after it's the most important sporting event on the yearly calendar. So Punjab United sadly lost this tie. And it's interesting, Punjab United, because you might think maybe that name comes from, maybe it's a community of Punjabi people who started the club and that's sort of representing their background or whatever. Because I don't know about you, but I don't consider Gillingham as super Punjabi myself. But then I thought maybe that makes sense. Now I looked up the names of the team. Um, Chris Edwards, Andrew Dyeth, Jack Barry, Stephen Ratcliffe, Jack Hopkins, Wayne Bushell, Paul Vines, Neil Sp- I have a really hard time believing that any of these blokes are from Punjab, personally. No, there's there's like three people named Jack in that team. <laughs> so what's going on? And I've looked at the team photo. They're all white men. <laughs> of course they are. So why is it called Punjab United? There's not one person that actually <laughs> seems to fit. <laughs> Fucking Punjab United, mate. <laughs> Imagine you're Maidstone and you go, oh shit, we've got Punjab United away next week. <laughs> you're thinking that's a, that's a long away day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's going to be a long coach trip. I have to go all the way to Ahmedabad. Yeah, but um, I'm sort of starting to become a fan of Punjab United. I can't lie. You're going to follow them on the road? I think it's hilarious that that's their name and they have zero Punjabi connection whatsoever. If anyone wants to send us some like Punjab FC football shirts, please do. Oh, we'd be happy. We'd, we'd come and watch a Punjab United match. I'd absolutely love that. Uh, it also says on their website, despite our name, anyone of any orientation, creed, colour is welcome to play for us. No shits judging by that team. Because this just sounds like a bunch of bricklayers. <laughs> <laughs> On to the weather then. Drizzle kicks coming at you now. And it's bad news for all my Icelanders out there. As experts say, a volcano in the country could erupt with less than 30 minutes warning. A magma accumulation near the seaside town of Grindavik is approaching levels seen in prior volcanic events. 7.6 million cubic metres of magma are bubbling under the surface. Once it hits 8 million, it's basically game over. That's when an eruption is almost guaranteed to happen. Iceland, not a big country, has already had three eruptions this year. And every time this volcano erupts, the residents of the town have to be evacuated. I mean, I just move. It's a bit inconvenient having to evacuate every fucking few weeks. I can't help thinking that if my home was getting repeatedly torched by magma... I'd leave. Yeah, you'd maybe get on the right move and look about a wee one bedroom somewhere else. Yeah. The, these Icelandic volcanoes are brought to you by Zillow. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm getting sick of, though, in the past couple of weeks? I think it was episode two. We covered wildfires in Chile. Yeah. Now it's volcanoes in Iceland. Yep. Like, there's just such fucking contradictions. You think it'd be cold. Yeah. Yeah. I just want, a, I, I want our next city, our next country, to just do what it says in the tin. Like, all these places I feel about with this extreme weather, just leave. That's yeah. what I always think. You you hear about these horrible flash floods, droughts, famines. Mate, just go, so, just go somewhere else. You'd absolutely, you'd absolutely love... Where would you love? You know what's a really great town? Birmingham. Butlin's Minehead. Butlin's Minehead. You'd absolutely love Minehead. <laughs> it's a hotspot. It's a cultural hotspot. They have a brilliant tournament every year <laughs> where you can watch people play darts outside. Uh, but this reminds me, if we if there is going to be another big volcanic eruption in Iceland, do you remember when the last one was? Like 2009, 10 or something? Yeah. So that caused, basically what, would, what happened is the volcano dispersed this huge quantity of ash into the atmosphere and it travelled, it was brought by the winds down through the Atlantic mm. and 
you can't fly through that. That will that will ruin a plane. So it totally disrupted air travel. And I was in Canada at the time and I had to go back for school. I was on holiday. Yeah. And we had this eruption and I got 10 days off school oh, because I couldn't go back. That volcano sorted you out. Mate, it was like a full body orgasm before I even knew what that was because <laughs> I was only eight. It was one of the most blissful moments of my life. Yeah. And actually, your parents were definitely stressing the fuck out and you were just chilling out in Canada thinking, you know what, 10 more days. My parents own a travel company as well, so you can imagine they were stressing yeah. out. <laughs> the only yeah. thing that I can really remember about that time is, you know Robert Lewandowski that played for Bayern Munich, <laughs> What's he played got for to do with this? Barcelona? Yeah. So he went on to be one of the top scorers in all those leagues in the Bundesliga, uh, Champions League, like he won the Champions League with Bayern Munich. He's now playing for Barcelona. Yeah. He was about to get a flight to join Blackburn Rovers before that. Is this really true? Yeah, yeah. genuinely. But the, the ash, the flights got cancelled. So he signed for Borussia Dortmund and won the German League instead. He had been playing for fucking Blackburn. In the championship? Yeah. Well, they were in the Premier League at the time probably, but they were about to get relegated. Get relegated. Yeah. That's the thing. I think if, if Dovsky had gone to Blackburn... I reckon he would have flopped, you know. Yeah, yeah. He'd be still playing in the lower He'd be rubbish now. like Rocky Santa Cruz. <laughs> he was, he gets he get shipped off to like the Spanish second division. Yeah. He'd, be, he'd be nobody. Santa Cruz was on rail for a couple of seasons. He's one of the streets don't forget players. But yeah, he really is. Yeah. It's a shame what happened to him, how he got shipped off from Man City, because he, yeah. he was techie for a second there. He really was. Mate, I, honestly, I think we could do with another, another big eruption. I'd like to see it, because it's, so, it's sort, of, sort of the thing is when... There's a few genre, there's a genre of events, U.S. election, um, horrendous natural disaster. What sort of grips the people? Or like when Love Island the first time it got really really big and it was in the news every single day, Beatlemania, Luke Listler of the Darts. There's these stories that you can sort of follow and everybody's following it and everyone's talking about it and it grips the nation. I th- I think this has huge potential to do that. So I hope. Um, that we get a massive eruption. And uh, I hope if you're living in Grindavik that you've uh, relocated. But don't come here. <laughs> Go somewhere else. You'd love Germany. <laughs> Germany's great. You'd love Hanover. It's a brilliant town and a cultural capital. It's not too late for you to make your five grand shooing these people away. Yeah. And they didn't they didn't mention Iceland in that home home office campaign to stop migration. It had some road countries in it. Vietnam. You could pitch it to them. Yep. Okay. Home office, if you're watching. If you don't want any more Icelanders over here, I'm your man. Okay. (laughs) Now we move on to questionable. This is the segment where I ask you some suspect queries and you come in with similarly suspect answers. Last week, I asked you, what was your worst culinary experience? Where was it? What were the effects? And we have so many responses that spilled over into this week. This is questionable food part two. I'm going to start with the first one. My dog ate my nan. Yeah, great. (laughs) Does it mean nan bread or your fucking granny though? Bit of both. (laughs) My dog ate my nan. This is where you get a bit mixed up between my dog ate my homework my nan, and my nan's dead. (laughs) Just in between. Ended up with dog scranning the nan. I, I, I hope... Actually, what's better? Your your dog, like, attacking and scranning your nan while she's alive or, or dead? Definitely know. dead. You don't want the fucking... You don't want your poor grandmother to be put through that misery <laughs> alive. Yeah, that's true. So, um, once again, that's not... T- I feel like that's not really a culinary experience. Nah, not at all. That's just a fucking crime scene. Yeah. Next up, on holiday with my family in Nepal in this tiny village in the middle of nowhere... Ordered a cheeseburger, got given a slice of cheese in a bun, nothing else. <laughs> Mate, I'm, you know what? I actually think he's he's in the wrong here. I think if you're in a tiny village in the middle of nowhere in Nepal, you've got to cut them some slack. Yeah, you have to be more specific. I, I just... I, I, I understand that maybe all they can get is a slice of cheese in a bun. Like, It's not just... You can't just walk into Greg's in Nepal. You can't just get what you want. You have to make do with what there is. Sausage rolls aren't as easily accessible, you reckon? There's no. I don't think there's a single branch of Greg's in all of Nepal. <laughs> I was thinking about going. To. <laughs> it's totally off the table now. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> Cancel them flights. 
Yeah, I think I think you're gonna have to cut the the rural Nepali farmers a bit of slack that they can't make you a proper cheeseburger here. I think you're gonna need to open your mind and uh, just learn to enjoy the experience. Next up, I ate a bit of pork in Antigua for dinner, and now I have Crohn's disease as a result. <laughs> I think this one's funny because it's so permanent. <laughs> like a lot of them, there's been a lot of sort of diarrhea shitting stories that we've had, but this is the first one where it's permanently changed your life <laughs> definitively for the worse at all times. You know what Crohn's disease is like? Yeah, it fucks you up. It, it's, it's basically chronic leaky ass for the rest yeah. of your life. Leak- <laughs> leaking like the drain pipes in my flat, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what was it he said he had? Bit of pork. A bit of pork done that to pork, the old Antiguan pork. Jesus Christ! Yeah, staying away from there too. Then, yeah, the famous Antiguan pork sword. Can you look up exactly what Crohn's disease is? It just surprises me that you can get it from a bit of Antiguan pork. Symptoms: diarrhea, stomach aches and cramps, blood in your poo, tiredness, fatigue, weight loss. Wait, this is basically that's basically a hangover though. That, <laughs> I was just thinking that's that, not. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's me after a big night. Literally just a few strepsil and like a pack of Rennies in your ground, you're yeah, good to go. Yeah, for it. So a bit of imodium. Yeah. Fucking grow up. You'll be fine. Crohn's disease. I think the I think the pork just repeated on you for a bit there. I think you're actually all good. <laughs> yeah. It's a state of mind. Have you ever had this? Blood in my poo. Only only when I've taken a shit that's so fat, I've had to sort of yeah. It's gouged the wall. There's now. been an anal fissure or two. Yeah. Like a a proper like, <laughs> it's been brewing there for some time. It's it's actually been brewing for so long. It's sort of dry and hard on the end. Yeah, <laughs> it comes out already dry. It's like oh, it's like you're squeezing out a rock. <laughs> you're just birthing a boulder, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and it properly hits the bottom with a thud. You like, you get a splash back whenever that happens. A huge displacement. It's, it's like they're it's lowering like a, the Titanic. It's like a water. fucking tsunami. <laughs> Have you seen these adverts uh, talking about the the Poonami? <laughs> no. So some some du- um, some nappy company yeah has started making these adverts range of adverts where they're like this this nappy can stop absolutely everything even a Poonami, which is something they've made up yeah for this advert. Remember when we were t- talking about the curry sauce last episode and that streak of poo down a baby's back. That's sort of what this is preparing you for. <laughs> but I think Poonami is such a disgusting term. It is. I feel like I feel like there's got to be a whole boardroom who sit and watch that. Yeah. And they've all agreed, oh, you know what, Poonami, that's great. That's fast. The, the fact that that was okay and got past the initial screening process says a lot about that company. <laughs> I can't remember who it was. Shruggy. It's fucking Pampers. Pampers. Yeah. Poon- Poonami, mate. Poon army sounds like something like I would say in one of my TikToks. Yeah. Like, oh, this is a bit of a poon army, if you know <laughs> what I mean. Next up, I once drank the drip tray of a George Foreman grill that clearly hadn't been emptied for weeks. Oh, my God. Another one where I have no sympathy because you totally did that to yourself. This is the sort of thing that unfunny people think is banter. Although, that being said, we we did play Sodium Carousel last week, so I'm not sure we can really talk. <laughs> yeah, we we've got no nothing to say. I about. had so I had a flatmate in my first year, and he was morbidly obese, properly obese as an 18 year old man, like yeah, properly fat, and his diet consisted exclusively of fizzy drinks and bacon sandwiches, so white bread, red meat, red sauce. And he used to cook. He had a George Foreman grill in the kitchen. And he used to cook his bacon slices every meal. He used to cook his bacon slices on there. Right? And then never fit off. And he had, at the end of the thing, he had, hadn't had cleaned it once. He genuinely had a whole university year's worth of bacon uh. grease. It was building up. It was, it was like layers of sedimentary rock with the different, with fossils, little fat deposits in it. And it was like varying shades of yellow and white, just fat deposits in there and that is one of the most disgusting things i've ever seen so i can only imagine this was grim i don't know what had me more disgusted the thought of that drip tray or the fact that the dad you mentioned is literally all i've had today basically <laughs> so I yeah, it was you i should have said that at the beginning <laughs> of the story yeah 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 it was adam right next up my nando's wrap had six rocks in it 
Fuck me. Yeah, someone trying to be funny again. Good one. Next up, bought two mince pies from the servo. So this person's Australian. That's what we would call a petrol station, mm. a servo. Eaten at 4.30 a.m. on the way to work. That's a rough shift. Are you a fucking miner? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you getting up so early? What's going on? No, actually, you know, lots of Australians actually are miners because yeah, that's yeah. where we get all our tin and stuff. I have a lot of like friends from back home that that's where they're going. They're going to Australia, even where uni degrees, just yeah. to do mining for a while because the money's that good. I find it insane that even in this day and age, people are still mining. Yeah. Like that's such a Victorian era. It's like being a chimney sweep or something. <laughs> Yeah, you would think that those sort of jobs have kind of been done away with. But yeah, it's like an old woman looming in a factory. You think, look, surely we have no need for this anymore. But people genuinely go out down there like proper Minecraft style with a pickaxe and hit walls. And yeah, a few little. torches. Yeah. And like breathe in just coal dust and yeah, die. That could out. not be good for your lungs. I suppose they're paying you well because they're half in your fucking life expectancy every shift. Yeah. And also, like, there's a pretty high likelihood it's just going to collapse behind you and you'll be stuck down there forever. You know what always freaks me out? And it's, again, I've only been in London a couple of months. Anytime I'm in the underground, I'm just looking up, being like, fuck, is any of them tiles looking loose? <laughs> I'm waiting <laughs> on it just to all come down Cave and in. me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause I, especially with some of the stations where I've had to go down three fucking escalators yeah. to get to my platform. Deep stuff. I'm thinking, like, what level am I at right now? How, I'm so are you thinking, how many metres of solid like earth is there above yeah. that can suffocate that me right now really freaks me out really yeah you know speaking of being underground i saw a madeline rg tiktok once <laughs> so you're about to say madeline Mc... <laughs> oh no no i'm not making a madeline mccann <laughs> <laughs> speaking of being underground what a fucking segue that would have been if you were no so i actually am speaking about madeline rg um so she i she made a tiktok once you know how she makes, she has her little sort of ideas, makes little points, you know. I'm going to have to Google this woman because I have no idea who she is. Ah, yes, I recognize her. Yeah, so she she basically makes videos where she comes and she she gives a thought that she has about something. And I saw one where she's like, you realize there is no reason that we don't live underground I was like, there's definitely reasons we don't live underground. Ask the Chilean miners, mate, <laughs> why we don't live underground. Also, imagine how much you'd have to dig out of the ground for everyone in the world to live underground. Mm. Yeah, that's a lot of fucking... That's a lot of access. If you're living in a cave, you're asking to you're asking to die. So, Madeline Argy, I just wanted to say there are reasons people don't live underground. She was like, oh, we'd be protected from the weather. We'd be protected, you know, from the wind, all this sort of stuff. It's warmer underground... You need fucking sunlight. You die very quickly of vitamin D deficiency. You'd end up having rickets or something like a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> so there you are, Madeline. I've answered that one for you. Anyway, bought two mince pies from the servo, eaten at 4.30 a.m. on the way to work, commented on how unusually flavorful they were. After consuming one and a half pies, they were illuminated for me to find that the flavor was, in fact, a good coverage of black mold. Effect? Cured me of the stomach illness I've suffered from for nearly two months. So the mold fucking helped him? <laughs> the mold cured his illness. This is the exact illustration of a negative and negative making a positive. <laughs> it's coming around. This guy's had chronic E. coli for an extended period of time. He's eaten a dodgy pie and it sorted him right out. That is, antibiotics and stuff can often be made from mold, isn't that right? Penicillin was just mold. That's yeah. moldy stuff, isn't so, it? So technically, there is some sort of sense to this. What well, now? Now, what I'm worried about is he's just consumed and probably thrown away what could have been a major scientific breakthrough <laughs> in curing the stomach illness that you have. This petrol station has the cure. Yeah, they're, they're doing something to it. Well, they're probably just leaving leaving them open. Also, on the shelf get, for too long. Getting a fucking getting a mince pie at like a deli counter. Or a petrol station. Is that not a bit strange? <laughs> um, so I will explain. This guy's Australian. So by mince pie, I think he means like mince. Like not a mince pie like a Christmas thing. Uh, right, like okay, we would have. Okay. Yeah. I think he means like a proper meat and gravy sort right, of pie. Okay, fair, fair. Still weird. I wouldn't buy one from a petrol station person. No, he's asking He's asking to fucking get more illnesses. Do yeah, <laughs> exactly. He's very lucky that it cured him. <laughs> After toking a roach, I ate 48 Kalamata olives and a jar of strawberry exa- 
strawberry jam that expired before my grandma did. <laughs> Mate, that is a rogue trend. I know that after smoking weed, people get hungry. But 48 olives and a jar of jam is would not be my first port of call. No, you, you attack like the crisp cupboard or some sort of sweet, some sort of chocolate. Yeah. I don't... You're not plowing through the olives. There's no way, surely. Nah. I'd rather have like a bread sandwich. Yeah. Which is just a slice of bread with two slices of bread around it. But that's... And the, the, the back-to-back, like, tangy brine of the olives and then the like the... The overpowering sweetness of the jam. It's it's a horrible combination. It's like that sandwich. You yeah, that sounds disgusting. Although the sandwich was not. <laughs> you yeah, know what? True. The sandwich is a perfect example of something you'd eat whenever you have the munchies. Just getting everything in and once. Yeah. And just packing it out. Maybe we should do a segment where you eat 48 olives and a jar of strawberry jam. <laughs> Do I get to be high to do it? Yeah, if you want. Fair enough. Yeah, we'll. we'll. You can you can uh, smoke a bifter on the show like Elon Musk on Joe Rogan. <laughs> Just the stock school, fuck it. Yeah, we're not public. We're not public, fortunately, so we can't tank the stock like that. Nice one. Yeah, yeah. We've got our that investors. Benefit. We don't have any investors to uh, please. Although the uh, the building inspectors might be a bit unhappy about the <laughs> breach of the fire codes. We're in the sixties. We can smoke. Yeah, that's true. Actually, got my cigar. Right here. Now, we're going to move on to our game segment, Gamey Schumer, of course, where we're playing another game that I sort of stole but put a spin on. So I'm not sure if you're aware of the excellent off-menu podcast, James Acaster and A. Gamble talking about food, but they interviewed the comedian Joe Thomas, who was Simon on The Inbetweeners. Yeah. And um, he spoke of a game they used to play at university called Upper Tea Tomato. So that was when... People would stand in a circle. What you would do is you'd th- be throwing a tomato around. So you'd throw a tomato to the next person. Then they'd rub it on their balls, take a bite, and throw it to the next person. And whoever drops the tomato loses. So I thought I'd put a spin on the game because I don't particularly eating like eating raw tomato. I also think just having one tomato would be too easy. Um, so we're going to play with an object which is known for its structural integrity, the chocolate orange, <laughs> and it's known for not breaking into many pieces. So this should be a fairly easy game. We're it also going to play... broken into many pieces. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to play with two in one game. And we're not going to rub it on our balls because we can't get our balls out on the internet without you paying for it. So we're just going to rub it on our crotch instead. So hopefully this should be an enlightening and enthralling game of uppity uppity chocolate orange. Let's get the oranges out. Yeah. So just another another quick another quick practice. Throw. Rub. Take a bite. Throw. Don't drop the orange. Yeah. Right. Three, two, one, go. You have to take a bite. Brown. <laughs> Our costume designer is not going to be happy. <laughs> My crotch is covered in chocolate. What a stupid game. When you have to drop it, we're just trying to eat the whole thing. <laughs> I think we'll call it a draw. Yeah, well, we'll take a draw on that one. I'll tell you what. It tastes a lot better than sodium carousel did. A hundred percent, yeah. <laughs> but I feel, I sort of feel a bit more dirty. 
<laughs> you took a proper huge yeah, bite. Yeah, my out. first bite was fucking four of the. <laughs> I thought that was. I thought it was just gonna splinter. You know what? It really held its structure. Well done, Terry. Yeah, you've really <laughs> <laughs> you've really improved the build quality of a chocolate orange. Well done, Terry. <laughs> I think I think he should be commended on improving the product. That yeah. held together. <laughs> I thought I thought oh this is just going to come apart at the seams straight away. I'm just going to be able to rip through this. <laughs> no, bit it's mine was like a rock. <laughs> It was like that guy's Nando's wrap with six rocks in it. That's what it was like. At least, at least nobody lost, I guess. Yeah. Didn't know, but. Oh no, I'm good. I'm all right, actually. Maybe we should offer it around the office. See if anyone wants any. <laughs> Matt, do you want some chocolate orange? Do you want some chocolate orange? No worries. Hey, it's okay. There's, it's, there's only been a little bit of bollock on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're calling it a draw. I would have really enjoyed that chocolate orange in different circumstances. <laughs> Not far off it. <laughs> so far. <laughs> so far over the course of doing this show, you've consumed a brownie and tuna sandwich, half half a, half a tube of salt, a whole chocolate orange, half a coffee, half a tea. <laughs> Mate, you've had a lot of stuff. So that was uppity uppity chocolate orange. Score is currently nil-nil. Now, if you like, comment, and subscribe, let us know if you like that game. We might play it again. Maybe. If the costume department lets us. Uh, <laughs> but next up is our segment, Out of Packet. This is our consumer advice and review segment where my producer, Aiden, orders something out of a catalogue, and I give you my honest thoughts and opinions so you at home don't have to try it for yourself. Aiden, what have you got for me? This week. So I've done a bit of browsing this week and I was kind of thinking that we've done three or four episodes now and every episode I've been wearing this hat and I've just kind of been looking at you and thinking that, you know, your your head seems a bit lonely. It yeah. needs it needs something along those lines. Um, and I found one that's apparently magic that when you put it on, it has some form of powers. So it's actually this one. So oh, wow. If you wouldn't mind just, first of all, what's your initial thoughts on it? It's very colourful. Yeah. I'm not sure what... I can't, can't imagine what sort of... I, I mean, it doesn't look like an English hat to me. No. Nah. I can't really imagine what sort of culture this would have come from. I've never really seen anything like this before. But I suppose I should try it on, just to see what happens. Well, one, boys. Tram Marley here. Welcome back to Radio Rufus. The greatest new sports games every single week. Come on, boys. Cricket's just happening. Scores are in. West Indians going back to the left-hander. Joe Root currently bowling for England. 62 for three in the second test at Kingston. Pontems. Hey, Dan, thanks for the hat, man. <laughs> You know what? I think I think you would look great with a hat on yourself. Ooh, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Is that a fucking Jordy? <laughs> uh, let me hear your yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Is that better? <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, man. Rasta man. Repeat after, repeat after me. Repeat after me. Wagwan boys. Wagwan boys. Trap Marley here. Trap Marley here. <laughs> Sound like a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> Give me another line. Gonna have a puff of reefer before Shenny Kwa say Wagwan to me trouser snake. Gonna have a puff of reefer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. It's your normal accent. Say Wagwan to my trouser snake. <laughs> Pretty good. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> no way I can play upon me crimson mushroom without a bit of refar. What the fuck did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> Feed that back to me. <laughs> three little birdies, three hot blondes here. If it's not snowing, I'm not going. Not too hot though. She be warm. Pretty good. <laughs> oh! The phone's ringing. Come on, boys. Here we go. Oh, 
what you say. Ari, Ari. Harman, Ari. I've just had some news come in from our Asian correspondent, Wagamama, in Saigon. This is today's news, today of course being the 8th of March 1965. In an extreme heightening of conflict that has been brewing for some time now, 3,500 US Marines have landed near Da Nang in South Vietnam. The United States have officially launched a ground offensive in the Asian theatre. The Mexican ambassador has come out with a statement on the matter. He said, I'm just glad it's not us this time. The US president and Spanish blowy LBJ is uh, supremely confident of an American victory. And I get it. After all, they're up against a bunch of rice farmers with broken Russian AK-47s. The entire might of the American military could not possibly lose this war. That would be like Leeds United, who finished second in the first division this year, losing to a bunch of dead ballers like Arsenal, who only finished 14th. Absolutely paltry. Should be a shoe-in victory for the US. I can't see any way in which they could possibly lose this. I do I do like an underdog, though, so I might stick like a few shillings on the in the Viets to pull off a, a miracle up. Yeah, so Bet Fred has put the chances of a Viet Cong win at 300 to 1. <laughs> Paddy Power has them at a thousand to one. I think that's incredible value. <laughs> might, might stick that on an acker. <laughs> <laughs> see if I can see if I can get a proper multiplier of my money. My <laughs> Vietnam War acker. How long how long do you personally think you would last in like guerrilla warfare booby booby trapped Vietnam jungle? Which side am I on? You're a US Marine. Yeah. Because I, I feel like if you are Vietnamese, you've got something innately within you that you can just operate better with in that environment. You can just tiptoe around it. Exactly. You'd be blending in with the bushes, climbing the trees. Yeah. Whereas Americans can't even blend in in London. I saw an American the other day and she was wearing full golf wear on the tube with a huge Louis Vuitton suitcase and then an American flag cowboy hat on. (laughs) Right? She's not lasting long in Vietnam. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) That's all I'm saying. There's absolutely no way. Yeah. She'd be dead day one. As soon as it landed, the VC would be right on her. I feel like I would be absolutely fucked trying to tiptoe around like these booby traps and stuff like that, especially in the jungles. But I don't know. I'd like to think I'd last long, but I would probably last about the duration of Creedence Clearwater Revival, Fortunate Son, and then yeah. I'd be fucked. Two minutes, 47. Is that exactly it? I, yeah. I that is impressive. It ain't me. It ain't me. That is like the Vietnam War anthem, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so as we're going back, I think this war is an excellent money-making opportunity because there's lots of great categories that you can bet on. There's a sort of under-over casualties. Obviously, you've got the exact scoreline, 1-0, 0-1 nil, nil are the two options, or a tie, 0-0 nil, nil tie, obviously. Uh, two-way bets, three-way bets. I'm thinking I'm I'm going to stick on... I'm Obviously, I'm sticking on for a US win. Because I'm thinking going for a Viet Cong wing is that's like sticking your money on Burnley to win the league. I think that's just too far fetched. You're just throwing your money away. Yeah, you're just throwing your money away at that point. So you've got to have a US win, but I think significant casualties. So I'm taking, in terms of the 3,500 US Marines, I'm taking over 1,500 casualties of first conflict. And I'm going, they don't take Da Nang within two weeks. And I'm getting 12 to 1 on that. So hopefully, I've stuck, a, I've stuck, um, Two and six on that. So hopefully it should be good. You should be in the money. That should seems. be in the money there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let, let us know what your Vietnam War ACA bets are. Uh, see if there's any good value amongst the bookies. And uh, let us know how you're getting on. Don't lose too much money on this war. It's not worth it. It also says at the end of this wire, and these are Wagamama's words, not mine. Vietnamese food is pretty grim and it will never catch on in the West. <laughs> I've never had Vietnamese food. Obviously, we don't have it over here. This the year in the year of nineteen sixty five. So, um, yeah, I can only assume it's terrible, and uh, no one will would ever eat it here. I'm. I just. I love things like spotted dick. Uh, toad in the hole. Toad in the hole. <laughs> toad in the hole. Toad in the hole is great. I like. I like it more. More toad than hole. If I'm honest. <laughs> If I had to go, if I had to choose between toad and hole, I'm going toad every time. Yeah, nobody uh, wants to be getting the hole. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> My dad went to a wedding once and the food was chicken and leaves and he had just leaves. <laughs> <laughs> pretty disappointing <laughs> that would be just like this. imagine ordering toad in the hole and getting all whole and no toad <laughs> who the fuck chooses the leaves <laughs> yeah so um yeah i'm looking forward to never eating any vietnamese food i'm looking forward to never hearing of a spring roll ever in my entire life yeah yeah <laughs> now as always we come to our musical serenade Outro, and this one I think has rightly earned its place in the Rufus Rice Hall of Fame. This is two weeks into uni. I'm two weeks into uni and I've got an STI. I thought I pulled a worldie, but she's just a 4.5, and I skipped every seminar this week. Think my future's looking bleak. My professor is a and my flatmate is a neek. My horse looked like a prison, both my sink and loo are blocked And if you take a listen, you'll hear my neighbour crack one off And last night someone burnt some toast, alarm went off at four o'clock And I forgot to do the group work, I'll just say I lost the dock I've got to call my bank and arrange an overdraft Jaeger bombs and lost Marys have drained the funds so fast And you know I can't cook for shite, have pasta pesto every night My mate said poker sock is class, but I won't go, I can't be asked. And don't call me a nitty, I'm not really into drugs I just think that ketamine makes club nights much more fun if I have a bum then sue me, I'm just two weeks Two weeks into uni Thank you everybody for listening to another rollicking, revolutionary, frankly radical episode of Radio Rufus. We'll be back again next week at Wednesday, 6 o'clock. Don't forget to comment, like, subscribe. Help us reach our goal, 10,000 followers, and we'll see you next time. Back to you in the studio.